We continue on our journey through the Gospel of Luke. We're at chapter 14. Today I'll be reading verse 1, followed by 7 through 14. You may follow along in the New Testament in your Pew Bible on page 72. Hear now God's word to you this day. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. The host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. This week I read a story about a very important man, General Peter Pace, who was at one time the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. He told this story about himself when he was a young captain in Vietnam. He says, there was an event in Vietnam where I almost made a very serious mistake. We had been on patrol and a young Marine, only 19 years old, was killed by a sniper. The bullet came from a nearby village he goes on to say, I was the platoon leader, and he was my machine gun squad leader. I was enraged, and I called in an artillery strike to get the sniper. Then I looked to my right, and I saw my 21-year-old sergeant. He did not say a thing. He simply looked at me, and I knew what I was about to do was wrong. I called off the artillery strike, and we swept the village as I should have ordered in the first place. We found nothing but women and children as the sniper was long gone. I don't know if I could have lived with myself had I done what I originally planned. I had almost allowed the rage of the moment to overcome what I thought had been some substantial thinking about who I was going to be in combat. He goes on to say, after the event, I called my platoon together in a little bombed-out crater, and I apologized to them. I told them 
If it had not been for my sergeant, I probably would not have made the right decision. The reaction of the platoon was amazing, he says. It was very warm, family-type response. I learned that a leader admitting mistakes and thanking those who point them out to him is really important. It's really important. I was amazed by this story that a young man in a dangerous and volatile situation could see, could truly see the error he was about to make. He saw another person, and in the eyes of that young sergeant, he saw his mistake. I must tell you, a prideful and arrogant heart would have been blind to such insight. And it made me wonder, did any of the guests at that Pharisee's dinner look into the eyes of Jesus and see the error of their ways? their prideful ways. I think we can realistically say that Jesus was in a dangerous situation. Oh, there was no gunfire or mortars, but I would imagine there were stares like daggers and whispers of how they might get rid of this upstart rabbi. He was eating with powerful men and he observed their behavior closely. And then, having observed the way they took the seats of honor, the way they seemed entitled to the best, well, he defied all cultural norms, and he dared to teach them a lesson in kingdom etiquette by one of his favorite methods, a story, a parable. He says this, the guests arrive at a wedding feast and they take their seats of honor. Don't do that. He says, for the host may come and ask you to move to a lower seat, and then what embarrassment and shame you will feel. Better to take the lower seat and ask to be moved up by the host. That's pretty good advice. I think perhaps even Miss Manners might agree with this. But Jesus isn't done yet. It is in verse 11 that we get to the crux of kingdom value. He says, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, if we read from a more contemporary version of the Bible, for example, the message, we might hear, what I'm saying is this, if you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to fall flat on your face. So be content to simply be yourself. And in doing that, you will become more than yourself. You see, this is the great polar reversal of God's kingdom. It's a world turned topsy-turvy of our values. It's a world turned on its ear where self-interest is not the main concern. It is a time when the meek or the humble will inherit 
the earth. I was recently encouraged to read a book entitled How Starbucks Saved My Life. It's another story of a great reversal in the life of a man named Michael Gates Gill. Now, Michael led a very privileged life. He was the son of a renowned journalist for The New Yorker, an Ivy League graduate, a VIP in an advertising agency. He had the great job, the big house, the beautiful family. That is, until he didn't anymore. He got downsized, divorced, and nearly destitute. He was lost and humiliated, and he saw no options in life for himself. Do you remember that childhood board game, Shoots and Ladders? Well, it's the most fun if you happen to land at a ladder and you get to go up quickly. We all want that. But Michael had hit one of those shoots, and he was down about as far as you could go. He had only one luxury left in life, and that was a Starbucks latte. And one day he went, using some of the last of his funds to have a latte, and by happenstance, or I like to say God incident, not a coincident, he began a conversation with a young African-American woman. It turns out she was the manager of Starbucks. And almost jokingly, she offered him a job. And what was more startling still was that he accepted this job as a barista. It was in that moment that new life was conceived for him. And I must tell you, those birth pangs were long and that labor was arduous to transform his life. But that's what happened. You see, along the way, he actually saw people that he had never paid attention to before. He learned from them. He came to see them as sojourners on this path of life. He learned a new way of life, a new attitude of heart, a new reverence for all people. He learned humility. And friends, that's what Jesus wants us to learn still today. To remember that those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted in the kingdom of God. He says in Matthew, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. But I want to make sure that you leave today knowing that being humble does not mean that you are weak or tame, or deficient in courage. It is an acceptance of both our strengths and our limitations, of not thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought, but not thinking too little either. It is a reticence to put ourselves forward for ourselves, 
but a willingness to have a servant's heart for others. A servant's heart. In her Rule of St. Benedict, Insights for the Ages, Joan Chittister sums up what it means to live a humble life before God. She says, humility then is the foundation of our relationship with God. It is our connectedness to others. It is our acceptance of ourselves. It is our way of using the goods of the earth and even our way of walking through this world without arrogance, without the need to dominate others, without being scornful of others or putting down others or disdaining those who are different from us. It is even walking through this world with ourselves not as the center. I think this is what Jesus hoped those Pharisees would see when he dined with them, that he would be the one from whom they would learn, that they would refine their servant's heart. And I believe that is his wish for us today as well. May it be so, and may our lives bring glory to God.